Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and welcome to another Wednesday afternoon webcast. Joining me today is David Burroughs, Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital. Over the course of this webcast, we will provide you with a brief market update. And of course, at the end of the conversation, we'll invite questions. So please, if you have questions, email me phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the chat. Thanks so much. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. How are you? Great. Thank you. How are you? Well, I'm fine. Thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. We're looking forward to, uh, to walking through some of the stuff today. It's been an interesting week. Uh, Absolutely. The, our, our themes sort of continue to rotate. Uh, but there's a little bit of bumpiness in the market over the last few days, so it'll be an interesting, an interesting point to discuss. I've actually asked Diana Avigdor to join, join, join the call today. Diana is our head trader, for those that don't know, uh, and she's a regular guest on, on BNN uh, to talk about sort of trading color short term uh, in the market. And I thought it might be useful to have her on today, so I will bring her on sort of as we go along. I just, just want to sort of start from the top. Uh, and just to start with the broad brushes, reminding people that what we are trying to do is, is not be everywhere. Uh, we're trying to use the process that we have to identify market leadership themes. And when I say that, I mean areas of the market that have some kind of a structural tailwind uh, where we could see not only improvement, but acceleration uh, or revaluation. Uh, groups that perhaps are underowned, but where something has changed for the better. Uh, and they will attract capital. So that could be asset classes, it could be geographic regions, it could be sectors, it could be themes, it could be different you know, market caps. Uh, we wanna try and find those groups where there is money getting put to work, where there is a tailwind and where that tailwind could go on for a period of time. We always, of course, watch for change, new leadership to start to evolve and old leadership to start to recede so we can transition our portfolios uh, of course, trying to do that in a timely manner. And then there are those periods of time where we need to be more cautious, have a higher cash weight, uh, and maybe sit on the sidelines because there is no leadership. Uh, not the case right now, uh, but certainly we know that those periods come. And so we have to have an ability to, to play defense and, and manage the downside. So what we're trying to do is provide a very tactical experience for clients uh, and and you know, I think their expectation is that we will have the tools to identify those productive parts of the market to focus in uh, and, and not waste our time and capital focusing in assets that are out of favor. So as most people know, uh, we believe we've been in a structural bull market since 2013's uh, um, period where we exceeded the highs from 2000. Of course, the market had gone sideways for 13 years without making progress. Uh, and in a structural bull market, you get kind of three steps forward, one step back. You certainly get corrections along the way, uh, but it's a it's a it's a productive time to be invested. Uh, and at some point, you know, structural bull markets come to an end, like in 1999 or like in 1966, and then money leaves for an extended period of time to go to other assets that perhaps are more favorable for the current environment. Uh, in the case of the 1960s and 70s, it wound up uh, uh, dividend growth wound up being a, a really hot, hot area. Uh, certainly some commodities did well in the period between 2000 and 2013, growth stocks went out of favor, uh, but, but there were other places to go. And in particular, during that period, it was emerging markets. So um, if we look at the S&P, uh, this is the nearer term picture. We had, of course, the correction 2015-16, where we went sort of from the top end of the channel to the bottom. Uh, in a in a uh, you know pretty good sized global correction, the U.S. actually was much better than the rest of the world. We had the sharp correction in 2018 fourth quarter. Uh, we had, of course, the sell off going into the pandemic, uh, and here we are back, sort of at the top end of the channel. Uh, Nasdaq, similar picture, although it didn't exceed its previous high from 2000 until 2016, and we've been tracking our way higher since then. Uh, I think most people know we believe we've been going through a generational bottoming in long-term rates, much like we did in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And that is an important thing to recognize because what worked during a reflating period was very different than what's worked since 1981 in a disinflationary period. 
And we have to recognize that the types of holdings we may want to have going forward may be quite different than the ones everybody has built significant exposure to over the last number of years. And of course, with that trust and, and uh, perhaps being a, a little overcommitted. So since the early part of the pandemic in March, we have seen bond prices generally selling off. And what happens slowly at first can turn into something a little bit faster. And over the last six, eight weeks, prices of long-term bonds really have felt quite, fell quite, fallen quite significantly. The high trade was $179 on a 30-year bond, sitting today at $139, so down $40 on a $180 bond. That's, that's a lot of money if you're a bond investor. Bond investors tend to be quite conservative. And so for all of those things that are attached to the bond market, you know, this has been problematic. Looking at it another way, yields have been slowly marching higher. And with that, you know, people ask the question, well, why, why are yields going higher? Are they going higher because we don't think we're going to get paid back and we think there's credit risk? Well, the measures that look at those things don't point to that. It in general is pointed to the fact that we all have an expectation that perhaps economic growth could improve going forward and that the long-term picture is more favorable. But that causes money to move from one bucket to another. Interestingly, in February of last year, there was quite a significant premium dividend available in the S&P versus the yield of 10-year bond. And as people have become more comfortable with risk and bid up share prices, finally, we've just reached the point where the yield on the S&P 500 is roughly the same as what's available on a 10-year bond. Now, the common denominator on stocks is that historically dividends go up or the cash flow improves. Fixed income is what it is. The coupon is the coupon. So it may be we want to own things with a rising stream of dividends as opposed to a fixed income if we think we're in a reflationary period. Other things that we've been watching, US dollar continues to be for sale. This is the US dollar versus the basket of world currencies. It has generally been weaker over the course of the past year. And that is investors taking money from a safe haven asset and moving it to more risk oriented assets where there could be better returns if economic conditions improve. But it's still relatively early stages. We're seeing some money flow back into equities. I've put this up over the last little while. We know that money has come out of equities for several years. And so the fact that we are seeing some money in this means that we are far from over. But more importantly, some money is coming out of cash and some money now is starting to come out of bonds and rotate towards equities. So this is an important rotation and one that we wanna watch because this gap can close. So when we look at the S&P, the underlying companies in the S&P continue to act well. Now, this is a picture of the RSP ETF. It's, an, it's a representation of the equally weighted S&P 500. In other words, one stock equals one vote. Apple worth the same as the smallest company in the, in the S&P. So the average stock continues to be very close to highs. And that's, that's great. That tells us that money is flowing into the average company. You know, breadth in the market has been pretty good. But under the surface, there are some things to take away. If you look at the largest growth companies like Apple and Amazon and so on, they have been correcting over the last couple of weeks. So after being in a pretty consistent channel from November, we have started to see some sloppiness here. Now that makes some sense because if you're buying a growth company at a time when growth is scarce and it has been scarce, people are willing to pay a premium for that growth many years out into the future for paying for that stream of earnings. If the yield in the bond market starts going up, the comparative improvement over that becomes less important. And so large cap growth stocks can have a tougher time when there is reflation taking place and when the prospects for more economically sensitive companies get better. And that's kind of what we've been seeing. So large cap growth weaker, and we can see that, for instance, in Apple. Apple share price trading roughly where it was 
in August rising market. That's people taking money from companies like Apple and buying cyclical stocks, things that have near-term prospects for improvement in their earnings if the economy gets better. Now, GE has been an underperformer for many years, but since October, the stock has more than doubled. And what we're seeing is money move into these groups that are under-owned. People have hidden from companies that are economically sensitive until recently. And they've been hiding in companies with long-term growth prospects that aren't really impacted by the economy. Now the pendulum is swinging the other way. That means there's an opportunity though, because the cyclicals in general are much smaller companies. They're much less owned. The large cap growth stocks are much bigger. It's a big pool of capital that can move and they are broadly owned, if not over-owned. So this is what we've been trying to be in front of, getting the, uh, ownership in investments that improve if the economy gets better and moving away from those defensive assets that people have been hiding in. Looking at it another way, as yields move higher on Government of Canada bonds, banks have outperformed, utilities have underperformed. This is money moving from less economically sensitive to more economically sensitive. And this continues. So this week, again, through the course of a kind of a sloppy market, uh, the bank pricing continued to move higher. This is the XLF index, the, the, the financials index, just having exceeded the highs from 2007, in my opinion, starting a new bull market in large cap financials. And Morgan Stanley, as an example, these were the highs back in February and March, way exceeding those highs now, making new highs again today and relative to the market behaving very well. So banks continuing to be uh, an area of leadership. Dividend growth, another area of leadership. Investors trying to move money to companies that have had a history of raising their dividends because if rates go higher, you want a rising stream of dividends to offset that. And relative to the S&P, dividend growth stocks continue to outperform. In fact, since October, this relatively stable cohort of companies, dividend growers, which tend to have less volatility than the market, are way outperforming the S&P. And this is where we've chosen to focus our income portfolio. Reflation tends to favor dividend growth stocks. And we are seeing dividend growth over the last couple of months. We talked a little bit about how commodities underperformed over the last 10 years, but have been making a turn. And again, this continued this week. The basket of commodities continued to work their way higher. And companies that benefit from the manufacture of commodities like nickel and iron ore and so on, also continue to perform well. Rio Tinto very close to new highs today. I highlight the fact that when the cyclicals get going, they can go a long way. The last bear market that Rio Tinto went through, when it exited, the shares were at $20. By the time the cycle was over, they were at $140. We've just exited a structural bear market. So the commodity rotation continues. Energy continues to strengthen another group that is under-owned and unloved after underperforming since 2014. We've slowly been building our weight in energy. So when we look at the S&P, we know that we've been working our way higher, but this represents about the last two and a half weeks of trading. And you can see it's been sloppier and a little choppier. And I thought I'd bring Diana Avigdor on to talk a little bit about why that may be, what some of the short-term dynamics are, and whether these are things that we should be concerned about uh, in the longer term. Diana? Hi, David. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so um, what happens over the short term tends to be a little more mechanical and less price sensitive. So let's, let's go through it a little bit. Uh, benchmarking uh, the rotation um, which is what Dave has been highlighting. It's been pretty evident uh, even today um, that that has been going on. Um, but what happens over uh, portfolios that uh, for many, many months have now been overweight, say technology, um, when this rotation happens, it kind of hurts certain asset managers and they need to um, sell um, portions of their portfolio 
in order to lower exposure. Um, this is not necessarily fundamentally benchmarked, but they need to lower some exposure in order to raise money for what, um, whether it's for cash flows or whether it's to rotate into the sectors that are working. So um, we've been seeing that certainly. Um, you might think to yourself, okay, so if there, um, if there is a rotation in the market and say money is being taken away from say technology that has worked really, really well over the last year uh, into a, a reflationary uh, reopening trade such as you know, copper or, or an industrial like GE, why isn't the S&P flat? It's the same dollar. Well, that's exactly the case. They do have a little bit of extra exposure that people need to, um, need to uh, get rid of. And that's what kind of happens over the short term as this rotation happens. Because the pool of money is bigger in technology than it is in the cyclical side right now, as it rotates, um, it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of impact. And this kind of trading tends to be pretty mechanical in the sense that it's not fundamentally driven. So it's not price sensitive. It's just mathematical, mechanical, and technical. Now, what we've also seen um, is we've seen last week um, not that rates, rates have rallied, that the US 10 year has gone from 1% to where we are today at the close at 146. But last week in the sell off um, pressure, it actually hit 160, 1.6%. Now, when rates move with this kind of velocity, there are um, funds that um, have strategic asset allocation uh, parameters. And what that means is that they have to have a certain percentage, a preset, a predetermined set percentage of, um, of exposure in equities versus bonds. When, some, when an asset class moves with this kind of speed, the other side of the equation needs to be rebalanced with an equal amount of speed and since it's already rotating out of a sector that has had some relative weakness, you don't find the buyers as you're trying to rotate out as the pension fund, that 60-40 um, asset allocator, uh, 60 equities, 40 bonds needs to rebalance this. They don't find the buyers that they would normally find in a more orderly market. So it actually exacerbates the situation. So Diana, let me ask it. Let me let me ask it and ask this question this way. Yeah. You know, we hear the terms strategic asset allocators, and we hear the other term dynamic asset allocators. Am I right? So the the strategic asset allocator says over a very long period of time, we are always going to have forty percent of our money in bonds and sixty percent of our money in stocks. Yeah. And so if stocks really outperform over a couple of months and bonds really behave poorly. Whether they think it's the right thing to do or not, they decide at month end to sell a bunch of stocks because now they have too much Absolutely. and buy a bunch of bonds, which have really underperformed. And right. this is kind of what we saw at month end here uh, in, in February and, and actually uh, at the end of January as well. Well, exactly, Dave. And, and actually, we've been seeing it for a long time. As long as equities outperform, this is a pretty high class problem because as long as equities outperform, they at some point, they don't have to, some are mandated to do so every month, some are mandated to do so every quarter, um, and some have some band of um, discretion. However, they eventually have to rebalance. And so over the period of bull markets, you will have these periodic rebalances, um, which is if the asset class that's outperforming will actually be sold in order to buy the asset class that's underperforming. Now to your question about dynamic asset allocation, well, dynamic asset allocation is what we do. We don't have a, a, a pre-mandated um, asset class um, uh, preset uh, vision, and we go to where we think is the right place to be. And so we are able to uh, do our, our asset allocation in a dynamic, uh, discretionary manner, but certain pension funds um, don't have that, uh, that they've, they've set themselves out to do uh, whatever their um, asset class mix is. But what, so this happens all the time, but sometimes it's more impactful than others. 
When you have rates go up with this kind of velocity, this is why we say we don't mind. We know why rates have moved up from 1% to 1.45. There's, it's, all, it's, it's normal for rates to come off a very, very low rate or low level that we've seen over the last whatever number of years um, as we reflate from the pandemic, which really, frankly, is expected to be quite a spectacular reflation period of say six to 12 months at the very least, at a time when the Fed is still there, where all central banks are actually still there, supportive uh, with their liquidity. 1.4% is not a high rate. Um, so I think equity markets are okay with the levels. I think we can sustain one and three quarters, 2%, also no problem, because on the flip side, we have an economy that's really reflating and the, um, the employment picture needs to get better. So we know that the central banks are going to be supportive. We have $3 trillion coming into the equity market, uh, probably, or to, or to the economy. $1.9 trillion was just approved. Uh, and $1 trillion is still from the previous stimulus. So we have a, a central bank that's supportive, a rate that has moved up to 1.4, that's true, but that's okay. But for the short term, and I guess that's why I'm here is to explain this mechanical rebalancing that happens all the time. Sometimes when it comes into a period of illiquidity in the equity, especially in the, in the tech area, that's actually being rotated out of. So that is where people are mostly invested. And when they rebalance, that is what they're selling into weak uh, or non-existent. Right. right. So it I came across I came across this slide uh, earlier, Diana, and, and it actually was after you and I talked, and it looked at the TLT, which is the ETF for long-term bonds. Right. And and it noted this chart that the the speed of the sell-off and the amount of volume on the sell-off uh, we haven't seen really uh, since uh, coming out of the 2008-9 uh, period where the market bottomed and started to rally. So it's interesting. This is very similar to what happened uh, coming out of the financial crisis. And arguably this has been quite a significant crisis coming out the other side, it's people getting repositioned and it creates right. a little bit of volatility. Right. That's great. So Diana, thanks thanks so much for, for, for coming on. I really appreciate oh. that. And uh, I hopefully we can we can have you on again again shortly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I just want to touch on a couple of other uh, charts I think that were useful that I came across over the course of the week. Uh, this came from Jim Skatakis, uh, our U.S. equity specialist, just highlighting what's been coming out of the national purchasing managers uh, indices. And so the the purchasing managers index has been improving as it's pointing towards stronger economic conditions certainly. But this is, this is, I think, a really important distinction. This is the improvement in employment, which is lagging. And this is what the Fed really cares about getting right. They're gonna keep the pedal on the metal until the employment situation repairs. On the other side, we're seeing prices paid in the economy really take off. Now, a lot of times people would say, well, that's something you really to be concerned about. But so long as the employment picture remains weak, they've made it clear they're comfortable seeing inflation in prices. And that, that's another reason why some of the groups that are more reflationary are outperforming uh, the areas that are more tied to, the, tied to the bond market. The second chart I found this week that I thought was interesting and worth talking about talks about, is, is, puts relative the earnings estimates and the changes in earnings estimates and what that's doing to price earnings multiples in the market. So on the top in gray is the price earnings multiple looking forward on the S&P. And you can see that since early in 2020, the PE has been coming down in the market, even though stock prices are going up. And that's because earnings estimates are improving rapidly looking forward. And the last time, again, that we had a period like this was coming out of the financial crisis. But then look what happened to the earnings estimates going forward. They just continued and continued to improve. 
So I still think we're early, early days in this improvement in earnings estimates. And where people thought stocks were super expensive, looking back in the early part of 2020, in fact, you know, their estimates for earnings were too low. And so we've seen sort of a continued improvement in earnings estimates recently. So just to be clear, there's some very clear themes in this market. Banks, this is Bank of America making new relative strength highs today on a very weak day in the stock market. Disney, consumer discretionary and reopening, making new highs relatively on a very weak day in the market. XBO Logistics, transportation company moving, moving uh, uh, freight from one place to another in the most efficient way, making new relative highs. Dow Chemical, making new highs, basic materials, basic building block for the economy. Cameco Corporation, uranium, making new absolute and relative highs versus the market, basic materials, reflationary. Uh, and Caterpillar, another example, trading very close to the highs and new relative highs, heavy equipment. So industrials over the course of the last few weeks are outperforming, financials are outperforming, consumer discretionary is outperforming, basic materials are outperforming. These are all reflationary sectors. And I just do a simple comparison to say what's happening in the utility sector, which is where you would go and hide if you thought we were in difficulty from an economic perspective. And we are nowhere near where they were in February when we headed into pandemic. So <clears throat> very important to recognize that while we all look at the index underneath the surface in a healthy market, there will be some groups doing well and some groups doing poorly. It's our job to make sure that we focus on the right groups. The, the other area that we've also seen some weakness in recently, although it's not catastrophic, has been large sized growth companies like the Apples of the world and Netflix of the world. They've had some relative underperformance over the last few months, really going back to October. And it's not like they've sold off a lot. They just are not performing alongside of the market. And so again, it's been important to kind of recognize that. Now in our process, a big part of our process is understanding leadership, trying to find pockets of our investable universe that are showing improving breadth, meaning more and more stocks are performing well. And also recognizing groups where fewer and fewer stocks are performing well. We want to focus in the groups we're showing expanding breadth, and we want to be reducing our exposure in groups that are showing deteriorating breadth. So as we sit this week, the long-term indicators for equities globally continue to improve and Canada continue to improve. We saw some weakness in the last week in the US. Two of our four short-term indicators are negative there. And primarily it has been in those groups we're speaking of. Now, this is an important measure because we're looking, this looks at the degree to which stocks are behaving the same as one another. And the fact that correlations have been falling, it means there are haves and have nots. Lots of opportunities in some groups that are showing expanding breadth and you have to be cognizant of those groups they're seeing deterioration and pull back on the stick. So we'll talk about that in a moment. From an earnings perspective, we're basically through the S&P 500's earnings period. 491 companies have reported. Seven, the average company beat the earnings estimate by 17%. That means that companies have performed better than analysts expected. The average company beat the revenues by 3%. Our job is to use our bottom-up work and identify the best businesses that we can find those most likely to exceed estimates. And I'm pleased to say that our holdings, when 59 of 61 companies have reported, our average company beat the estimate by 29%. So the average company, the S&P beat by 17%. We had almost a double of that beat over the course of the quarter. Very pleased with the analysts work on this. Uh, our average company beat the revenue estimate by 5%. So from a sector perspective, it would make sense that we have continued to expand our holdings in financials. At one point, the financials were over 30% of the market. They're not even close right now, but our holdings are significantly overweight in financials because we think we're in a new bull market in financials and reflationary assets. Technology, we continue to take our weight down. 
we were two months ago over market weight, which was 30, which is about 30% of the market. We now have 23% of the firm assets in technology related companies. So that's been coming down steadily and consumer discretionary is rising and materials is rising. Uh, again, back to that sort of reflationary theme. On the other end of the spectrum, utilities continue to shrink and our holdings very, very small, real estate very, very small. And of course, government bonds, very small. <clears throat> Energy has gone from a 1% weight to a 6% weight. Now this is across portfolios. And of course, every portfolio is a different mandate. The one thing that is common is that financials do fit in our equity portfolios and also in our income portfolios. So that helps explain why such a significant weight. So we watch and we react. Um, right now, from a market perspective, we're comfortable. From a sector perspective, we are being cautious on some of those groups we've talked about, utilities and REITs, uh, and some areas of large cap tech. In fact, you know, we sold our Apple over the last two weeks. I think we've had virtually none left, uh, which feels odd because it's been such a dominant company for a long period of time. Uh, but uh, there are other things to do, and they may not be companies that are held nearly as broadly as Apple and lots of room for additional appetite. I'll touch on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency just for a second, just because we have been talking about it. Um, we've had a very good, good move in our uh, uh, Bitcoin exposure going back through the course of the last year uh, since, since the fall, we corrected a little bit coming out of the, coming into the new year, we rallied further, we corrected a little bit and we've started another, another rally here. So continues to behave very constructively, higher highs and higher lows. And as long as the US dollar is weak and as long as the Fed continues to print money, I think it's likely that these cryptocurrencies are gonna continue to act, to act well. <clears throat> Adoption continues. Uh, we understand that there's a good chance that there is a raft of U.S. ETFs coming over the next period of time, which again will create more demand. And the long-term picture continues to improve. So uh, we continue to be constructive. Um, we are keeping our eyes wide open for signs of weakness. We will get uh, more defensive if that is required. Um, you know, uh, March can be a bumpier period, so we are watching it pretty closely. But right now, we're playing defense by protecting ourselves in some of the weak sectors as opposed to the market overall. And with that, Pam, if we have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, absolutely, Dave. Thanks so much for the overview. And thank you, Diana, for joining. It's always nice to hear your thoughts and uh, feedback on what's happening on our trading desk. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Stephen in Toronto, wondering if um, March end we'll see even more aggressive rebalancing because it's quarter end for many funds. Thoughts, either David or Diana, because I know Diana, you often see in our ears to the ground and uh, with respect to um, what's happening on fund flows. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, there's two aspects to this. Um, one is, yes, we will see rebalancing. But it also depends on uh, the relative performance of the two asset classes. So uh, it's, it's likely that if March, if equities will be down in March, for example, there will be less of a need to rebalance. It really depends on the relative performance of the asset class over the quarter for that particular fund flow uh, participant. And the other thing is, is gonna, um, is gonna matter what uh, if, for example, we have another rate tantrum like we had last week, uh, it's possible that it forces um, some asset manager hands. Um, so we can't predict ahead. All else equal, if equities continue to rally and uh, uh, relative to bonds, all else equal, um, there will be some rebalancing. But like I said in the beginning, it doesn't always impact the market so much. We've seen rebalances many, many times. Um, it's a high class problem equities do well, they need to rebalance every once in a while. So usually when there is demand, um, it usually gets absorbed pretty well. Uh, but, just, but, but, but Diana, just to put a point, I mean, the move, the move in February in the long end of the bond market was, was a very rapid decline. So it was like a 7% decline in a 30 year bond in the course of a month, yeah. which is highly unusual. I mean, was, you can, yeah. you can as, as we looked at that chart earlier, 
you can go back over the last 12 years and you have to go back to the, to the bounce off the bottom in, the, in rates from the financial crisis in 2009. So this was um, a pretty extreme example. This, this was pretty extreme. Uh, some, one of, some of the reflation uh, narratives, I mean, there was another technical factor that triggered last week's rate tantrum was also a seven year bond auction that did not do too well and left dealers with a lot of bonds on their books. Um, so they needed to hedge that out as well. Doesn't happen very often to this extent, but we are going through a different trading paradigm that may or may not continue as this reflation goes on. And I guess my only point is that if we see uh, short-term tantrums like this that trigger some kind of re re asset reallocation over the short term, those are quite great opportunities to actually pick up the stocks that you like because uh, in the equity world, it should eventually all balance out. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it is interesting. And so just to, just to touch on that, you know, so <clears throat> this is the power of being in leading groups. So this is Bank of America today was down 0.09 of 1% on a day when the NASDAQ was down 3%. So when no, you have these tantrum no. days, when you have these tantrum days, yeah. it lets us see where the strength is. The things that are able to hold up well on a down day show you where the buyers are, you know? And so I look at something like, uh, like a Freeport was down, down 2%. Tech Resources was down uh, not so much earlier on. It might've got weak at the end of the day. Yeah, it wound up up two and a half percent on the day. So, so this, th these days when you get sloppiness show you where the strength is uh, and where the resolve is. And, and as strength comes back in the market, it tends to be, you see that strength come back to those groups. Exactly. Dave, next question. This one's for you. What are your thoughts on renewables? Uh, well, I mean, look at one of our biggest positions is Cameco uh, Corp made a new high today. I wound up down 60 basis points, but traded as high as $18 today. Uh, I think these are, you know, I think that, that renewables are, uh, are important. Um, you know, alternate, alternate energy, some, some areas uh, get caught up in tech, uh, like, you know, the solar group had a rough day today, but it's a high multiple growth area, uh, whereas the materials companies are less so. Um, so it really depends on where you're looking. But longer term, you know, alternative energy, we think continues to look quite favorable. And do you see renewables in the same light as utilities? Well, you know, it's, it's, again, it's all in degrees, but for instance, um, you know, we have some holdings in next gen energy, sorry, in, uh, in NXE, where am I going here? There. Uh, NEE, um, Nextera. Now it's backed off, right? It's backed off from $86 to $72. But over the course of the year, if we were to do a comparison of next era versus the utility sector it's way 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 outperforming the group so this is wind and solar along with some traditional energy um i think that it's still a utility and it still gets impacted but it is much more favorable than than a, a old line utility and for all those gold bugs out there dave um, what are your thoughts on gold? Is right now a great buying opportunity for gold? Look, um, you know, the alternates to the US dollar in general are attractive. Silver has been outperforming uh, gold. Um, and, you know, I think that the technical setup, you know, is really quite good. We, we made highs, we consolidated. We're consolidating above the moving averages. This is sort of a one-year picture. If you go out to a five-year picture, you know, this would be quite typical to get this kind of consolidation. And I've been saying this over the past few weeks. It's probably a matter of time before we start another leg higher. Um, so I do think that they're favorable. You've got a strong commodities backdrop. You've got a weak U.S. dollar. 
uh, and you've got some inflation in the system. So silver is more attractive because it's more of an industrial metal than gold is. And so the silver producers are acting a little bit better. Uh, but, you know, they are they are consolidating. We got to wait and see a new leg start. Thanks, Dave. Michael in New Brunswick wants to know your thoughts on uh, Visa and MasterCard in a rising interest rate environment. Well, look, MasterCard continues to chug along and it's because it is a grower. Um, um, uh, and the growth in digital transactions is, is accelerating. I think it is less interesting and less attractive than, than other areas of financials that are more tied to reflation. So the relative price performance, the absolute price performance, in other words, what the absolute price is doing is fine, but it's, it's one is lagging the other. Um, see if I can throw that up here do a comparative chart. So if we put up, um, let's add MasterCard, sorry. Let's see if I can do this quickly. MasterCard, and we're gonna put up uh, Bank of America, and we'll X a couple of these out. Um, you can see that since October, Bank of America is way outperforming MasterCard, which has more or less been sideways to higher. So I think that what we're seeing is we're seeing some money rotate out of financial technology into things that are more helped by the current environment. And you're going to get more of an earnings boost in the banks than in the card companies when the yield curve is steepening the way that it is. Thanks so much. Well, Dave, Diana, that concludes our questions for today. And as always, if you have additional questions that you would like addressed offline, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're always happy to speak with you. And uh, Dave, I'll leave you with the last word. Look, um, you know, we continue to look out across the water to see what we can see that might be concerning. Uh, and certainly uh, there are some sector moves that we are taking seriously and we've slowly been reducing our tech weight, even though we really like the tech group. There are so many dynamic companies there um, and we continue to bump up our weights and the groups that are working. Uh, and, uh, and the market is not going to be without, without bumps along the way. Um, but uh, in general, uh, low correlations, uh, uh, benign credit spreads, are supportive of markets. We think we're gonna to continue to see very favorable monetary and fiscal stimulus. Uh, and until the employment picture uh, gets a lot better, we're gonna have the help of the Fed and other central banks around the world uh, at our backs. Um, we are on our way to mass, uh, mass uh, immunity in the US herd immunity. Um, Fauci talks about April, May. And that means that the reopening uh, sectors are going to continue to perform well. So, so for now, uh, this is this is kind of where we're positioned, and we'll update again next week. Wonderful. And I just wanted to remind everybody that next week we're going to be featuring uh, the portfolio managers on Barometer's new music royalty fund. So look out for details on that. And um, have a great evening, everyone. Have a great week. Thanks so much.